What kind of violin should I buy? That is a common question I get from parents and students. And in today's video, I'm going to break down some of the things you should look for when purchasing a violin or whether buying a violin is even worth it in your case. Stick around. I've talked about this on the channel before, but there's always this misconception of renting versus buying. Of course, when you're buying an instrument outright, you're not paying um, a yearly, like an annual or monthly fee for the instrument. So there are the benefits of actually purchasing and owning your own instrument. However, sometimes the upfront costs of owning an instrument may be more expensive than you might have imagined. To answer the question, what violin you should buy? Well, whenever you are ready to become really committed to playing the violin, because if you're just trying out the violin, then it may not even be worth actually purchasing an instrument with a case and a bow and not to mention you have the maintenance of the strings and you know like regular wear and tear of the instrument you have to always go to a luthier or a violin shop to make sure you get that up to date but with a rental violin you really have the luxury of just having and buying the insurance with the instrument i know that many violin and other string shops in my area what they do is that they include insurance in case like a uh, violin string breaks or you know you want to replace the bow hair on your bow you know that is a, a really easy switch and for someone who doesn't have a lot of knowledge of the violin then that could be a really um, comfortable route to go because you have experts in your corner to really identify the problems and they could really help solve those problems for you if you're renting if you're going to buy an instrument be prepared for the extra costs that are gonna be associated with buying and owning an instrument. Similarly to owning a car, for instance, when you own a car, you own it outright, but you may have to change the tires every once in a while. You may have to do the oil change, or I mean, unless you drive electric, then, then it's just a tire change for you. But you get the point. You have extra like outside costs that you have to think about. Some of those outside costs that you may not even have thought about for violin is again, changing the strings. I know for many years when I played on an instrument, when I was really tapping or playing a little bit more aggressive repertoire, I had the grooves go into my fingerboard and I had to have a luthier really flatten that out for me. And if you have a bow, depending on how expensive the bow is, you might wanna consider a bow rehair. But if you're purchasing a bow for less than $100, it really doesn't make it worth it for you to purchase a bow re here if you, you can just buy an extra bow for the same amount of money. For anyone who's watching this video who is really not sure if violin is for them, renting is a safe way to go. You're not spending a lot of money up front. You want to try it as a hobby. That's a great way for you to get started. However, for the more serious, more dedicated amateur or beginner violinist, or you know, you really, really want to do well, it may be worth talking to a local violin teacher or a teacher that you know and have them in your corner to get the best violin deal for you. What's great about living in this time right now is you don't have to spend a fortune to purchase a really high quality instrument. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars or even tens of thousands of dollars just to have a reliable instrument. There are many violin shops around the globe and I'm gonna leave a couple links down in the description below for you to take a look at some of the violins that I personally recommend to my students so that you can get the best deal. And if you decided you're gonna be buying an instrument, a few things that you need to look out for. You need to look out for the weight of the instrument. If you're a beginner, you're not really used to having a heavy piece of wood on your shoulder and you don't want to be having too heavy of a violin on your shoulder so i recommend maybe talking to someone over the phone or some or going into your local string shop to really figure out what is the best like weight for you for your violin because violins are made of different types of wood so it would be good to consult someone with that another thing that i may encourage you to take a look at is the thickness of the neck of the violin i know that some beginner violin companies that make like you know very cheap violins don't really pay attention to those small details and as a result the finger board is really thick and the neck is really quite uh heavy and thick so you may be more prone to actually having an injury on your violin and you know violin i for, for me is considered you know a very physical activity as well like a sport so you want to take care of your muscles and your nerves and your joints. Those are like really tiny things that a beginner violinist may not really think about. 
And also when you're in a violent shot, make sure that you get something what's called a shoulder rest. And a shoulder rest, what it does, it helps you really um, have support of uh, the violin on your shoulder. It's called a shoulder rest, right? It was invented to prevent injuries. So if you have a long neck like I do, then I recommend having a shoulder rest or again, consult with a violin teacher to get the best fit. And there are many different kinds of shoulder rests out there by many different brands. So experiment with them and see which one will be the right fit for you. But we also cannot neglect the bow. You know, we also don't want to have a very heavy bow for the reason that your bow may be more likely to shake. Usually a good violin bow might be between 60 grams and 62 grams with my experience. My experience for me, I tend to be kind of in the middle. I have a bow that's actually 61 grams. So, you know, I kind of split the difference there. Um, for one, it allows me um, a little bit of lightness, but also I get the, the heaviness and the weight for me to get a really solid sound. There are also some violin accessories that you have to think about when you're purchasing an instrument. You make sure you have a violin case that is like standard and you wanna make sure you have some rosin because that allows the bow hair to actually grip the string so that way you're not having this kind of icy sound. If you're purchasing a violin bow for the first time, the bow hair, the horse hair is actually not rosin. So you may experience like a little bit of an icy sound or like you're not a, like a, not a good grip. So apply some rosin. I'll leave some links down in the description below for you to really um, get to know what I recommend for my students. And of course you want to have an extra set of strings because you never know with the change in seasons, with the change in temperatures, uh, depending on when you are watching this video, maybe winter, it could be summer, it could be spring, but I always recommend having an, an extra pair or an extra set of strings in case a string flies off or breaks, you have a backup. And I'm also gonna leave um, a string recommendation down in the description below for you to take a look at. If you're interested in getting like good advice on different products, I actually have a specific playlist just for you. So I want you to take a look at this playlist right over here for you to take a look at some of the products that I use and recommend to my students. And if you made it this far into the video, my name is Eric, I'm a violinist. I do a lot of violin tutorials, violin product reviews, and I wanna thank you so much for watching until the very end of this video. If you haven't done so already, it would mean the world to me for you to subscribe, hit the bell notification, so that way you get notified for when new violin videos come out. It really helps me out to produce more violin content for you.